Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and it's time for a G.I. Joe comic book review. I've been trying to do these comic book reviews every month, but I haven't been keeping up with them very well. They've been kind of irregular. But since we don't have a full G.I. Joe toy review this weekend, I thought this would be a good time to catch up on the comic book reviews. We will be looking at issue number 25 this time. Just recapping issue number 24, after G.I. Joe captured Cobra Commander, Storm Shadow came to his rescue. Storm Shadow managed to spring Cobra Commander from captivity, but then the G.I. Joe team captured Storm Shadow. Cobra Commander returned to Cobra headquarters in Springfield to confront Destro, the Baroness, and Major Blood, who had tried to take over the organization in his absence. Major Blood had tried to keep tabs on the ninja Storm Shadow by placing a tracking device in Storm Shadow's sword, but Storm Shadow had discovered discovered the tracking device and mailed it to an address in Florida. At the very end of issue number 24, two new characters, Wild Weasel and Firefly, were investigating the shack in Florida at that address, only to discover it is occupied by Zartan. Moving on to issue number 25, we have a cover that shows the Dragonfly helicopter swooping down and attacking the Water Moccasin. Cobra Commander is driving the Water Moccasin and Zartan is standing on top. Nothing on this cover is quite toy accurate. Everything just seems sort of distorted from how it ought to look. But it is an exciting and energetic cover. Other than the fact that this issue does include these vehicles and these characters, it doesn't really reflect what happens in the issue. The publishing date on this issue is July 1984. On the splash page we have a title, Zartan, but Zartan does not appear on this page. Instead, we have Short Fuse driving a boat with Roadblock and Storm Shadow, and the boat is headed toward Alcatraz Island. We have a creative team of Larry Hama script, Frank Springer pencils, and Mike Gustavich inks. The Joes plan to use Alcatraz to imprison Storm Shadow. Of course, Alcatraz was used as a federal prison up until 1963. Storm Shadow announces his intent to escape, and that would suit Roadblock just fine because that would give Roadblock another opportunity to beat him up. As they are locking Storm Shadow in his cell, we see the same tattoo on his right arm that we saw in issue number 21. We cut now to the Florida Everglades, where the water moccasin is speeding through the swampy water. In the gun turret is Cobra Commander, Destro, and the Baroness, and it is not driven by Copperhead, it's driven by a generic Cobra Trooper. This is all wrong. This artwork totally distorts the proportions of the water moccasin. It is possible to carry that many people on the boat, but you cannot fit three people in the gun turret. Not even close. Zartan then approaches on his swamp skier and does a jump over the water moccasin. So this is our first look at Zartan in this issue. Zartan and the swamp skier also don't look quite right, and I have to say this about Frank Springer's artwork. His artwork has never been my favorite on G.I. Joe. He doesn't make any attempt to make things accurate. The artwork seems unfinished in places. There are some lines that are just missing, and the colorist even has a hard time figuring out where the coloring should start and stop on the uniforms. On the one hand, I like the energy and looseness of his style, but on the other hand, it just seems to lack effort. Zartan brings Cobra Commander Destro and the Baroness into his hideout, which is a shack in the swamp, but he reveals that not all is as it seems, as he transforms the interior of the shack from a rustic setting into a high-tech headquarters. We cut to the Gulf of Mexico, where the Joes are aboard a freighter, planning on sending a recon team to check out the shack in Florida. This freighter, the USS Jane, was G.I. Joe's main water transport before they got the USS Flag aircraft carrier. We get some new characters, Deep Six and Mutt and Junkyard, so we are rounding out our 1984 lineup. After expositing about the mission, Zap and Wild Bill go to the mess, where we get a larger panel with a bunch of the Joes sitting around eating. Torpedo is eating lunch, where wearing his diving suit for some reason. I feel like this panel is supposed to have more impact, like this is the big reveal of the team for this mission, but the panel's not big enough, so the figures in the panel are still kind of small. Nothing quite looks right. Nobody's uniform is drawn correctly. 
And take a look at the flag on Wild Bill's arm. It's got like three red stripes, and that's when the artist decided that was good enough, and so he just stopped. Before they leave on the reconnaissance mission, each of the characters shows his signature personality trait, like Junkyard is friendly, and Mutt is mean, and Tripwire is clumsy, and Deep Six just isn't very friendly. Meanwhile, in Bethesda Naval Hospital, Snake Eyes, in his full commando gear, is visiting Gung Ho. Gung Ho was injured in the capture of Storm Shadow. Gung Ho notices Snake Eyes has the same tattoo he saw on Storm Shadow. When Snake Eyes hears the description of the tattoo, he quickly disappears like Batman. This scene is necessary for the narrative. In issue number 21, we saw that Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow had the same tattoo, but we did not learn why. That was a few issues ago, so the reader needed to be reminded of that connection. Up to this point, Snake Eyes was unaware that he had a connection with the Cobra Ninja. Remember, in issue number 21, he did not see Storm Shadow's tattoo. This is the first he's learned of it. I also like that Gung Ho is in the hospital. He was injured in the previous issue, and it's nice to see that the injuries have consequences. The characters don't just magically heal by the next issue. In the secret G.I. Joe headquarters, the pit, Hawk and Scarlet exposit more about the mission in Florida. And Hawk's uniform is not figure accurate, but the holster on his chest does kind of foreshadow the version 2 figure. Hawk gets a coded message from Gung Ho. Gung Ho is the first to notice this connection between Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes, and he immediately calls his boss. Hawk calls over to Alcatraz and talks to Duke and orders a check on Storm Shadow. Back in the Gulf Coast, two Dragonfly helicopters are taking off from the deck of the ship and the ground mission guys are riding on the skids. They even have the dog riding on a helicopter skid. There's no way that would work. Deep Six puts on the bubble helmet for his pressure suit and it is so awkwardly drawn. I'm sorry, this artwork is just bad. I try to see the positive in it, but this is just poorly drawn. Back at Zartan's headquarters, he has the captured Wild Weasel and Firefly brought up and Zartan reveals a little trick where he shakes Firefly's hand and absorbs his camouflage pattern. This is the first time we see Zartan's shape-shifting and disguise ability. It's not explained exactly how Zartan does this. In later issues, they try to explain it as holographic technology, but holographic technology cannot explain everything that Zartan does. In interviews, Larry Hama has suggested that Zartan may have mutant powers. This goes much more deeply into the science fiction realm than this comic book has before. These two pages also give us our first look at the Dreadnoughts. The Dreadnoughts do not get a grand entrance, they're just sort of there. They look more or less like they're supposed to too, but they're still a little off. The coloring is off, their uniforms are a little off, their hair is off, and I'm not sure if this is because these are early designs of the characters, or if the artist was just lazy. We jump back to the swamp where the Dragonfly helicopters are sweeping in low to drop the team off. The ground team jumps from the low-flying helicopters into the shallow waters of the swamp, and of course, Tripwire is clumsy, so he falls face first. The personnel on this mission is a little curious. I'm not sure what Tripwire is supposed to do on this mission. Mud and Junkyard could be used for tracking, so that kind of makes sense. Torpedo is a Navy SEAL, so he would cut it, but he is still equipped for diving. Zap and Airborne are aboard the helicopters, and honestly, either of them would make more sense for the ground mission than Tripwire. Firefly and Wild Weasel attack the Dragonfly helicopters in the water moccasin, and I am beyond confused by this artwork. The dialogue suggests Wild Weasel is driving the water moccasin and Firefly is in the gun turret, but the artwork suggests that Wild Weasel is in the gun turret, and then on the next page, Firefly is in the gun turret and Wild Weasel is definitely in the cockpit. We have four pages of this battle in the swamp between the Dragonfly and the Water Moccasin, and interspersed in those pages we have random panels at the Alcatraz location, and I do not understand this transition. There's no parallel action between what's happening at Alcatraz and what's happening in the swamp. There's no logical link between those panels and what we are seeing in Florida. 
they're just out of place. We get our first reveal of the shark flying submarine piloted by Deep Six, and on the first two panels it's drawn so small and with such choppy lines it's hard to even tell what it is. There's one panel where the water moccasin looks like it's been squished, and Deep Six looks like he's driving with his foot up on the dashboard, and the shark has a car steering wheel? There's that awkwardly drawn bubble helmet for Deep Six, too. It's just a weird shape. It's almost like the artist forgot he was supposed to draw it and then quickly sketched it on there. This page that provides the conclusion to the swamp battle is the perfect illustration of my problems with the art on this issue. Panel 1. The shark dives into the water, under the water moccasin, and then re-emerges behind it. Panel 2. The shark is somehow facing the opposite direction with no indication of when or how it turned around, and is now attacking the water moccasin directly from behind. Panel 3, Firefly and Wild Weasel jump from the badly drawn water moccasin, which capsizes. Panel 4, the shark fires a gun at the hull of the water moccasin as Firefly and Wild Weasel swim away. I don't know exactly what part of the shark we're looking at or where this gun is that it's firing. Panel 5, the water moccasin blows up. It's a small panel for what should be the grand conclusion to the battle. Panel 6, we're back in Alcatraz. I believe I can decipher how the storytelling is supposed to flow, but I shouldn't have to decipher it. The action and the motion of the vehicles does not flow from one panel to another. The point of view jumps the line. There's no special emphasis to what should be the great climax of the battle. And then there's a random panel of Alcatraz thrown in there for no damn reason. Back at Zartan's lair, the Baroness's internal organs are being compressed by her leather corset. And who is that female character sitting next to Ripper at that computer panel? I don't know who that's supposed to be. If it's supposed to be Buzzer, then that is a very badly drawn Buzzer. There's some dialogue here about loyalty and betrayal, you know, supervillain stuff. It recaps some of the drama from the previous issues. Back in the swamp, Junkyard has caught the scent of something and is running after it. Mud is chasing him and ordering him to stop, and the dog is ignoring all of the commands. So exactly how did this improperly trained dog get selected for the team? Suddenly, we're back at Alcatraz as Roadblock, Duke, and Steeler inspect Storm Shadow's cell to find it empty, the ninja has escaped. Back, back in the swamp, Junkyard has led the Joes to Firefly and Wild Weasel, who are captured again. These guys are worthless. Again, Junkyard runs into the swamp and ignores the dog handler's commands. This dog needs to go back to doggy school. The dragonflies safely make it back to the freighter, and the shark is hoisted to the deck by Crane. Deep Six passes on a handshake from Wild Bill, because, you know, Deep Six is not a friendly guy. Wild Bill's ready to fight over it. Settle down, cowboy. Back at Zartan's lair, there's a sound at the front door. Zartan opens the door to see Junkyard. Junkyard has found his way all the way to the cabin. Zartan pulls his pistol and aims it at the dog, and that's where the issue ends. That's our cliffhanger. Will Zartan kill the dog? At the bottom of this narrow panel, in tiny letters, it says, Next, Snake Eyes the Origin. And that's something I'm really looking forward to. I'm struggling to appreciate this issue. In some respects, it's an important issue, but in other respects, it is a major step down from issue number 24. The artwork has a, eh, that's good enough quality to it. It lacks effort, and I hate to say that about any artist because drawing a whole comic book is not an easy thing to do. I don't pretend like I could do that, but I have eyes, and I can see that some of the stuff just ain't right. The proportions of vehicles changes from panel to panel. I understand that sometimes you can't translate the features of a toy perfectly into a comic book, but that's not what I'm complaining about. Within the comic book itself, it's not consistent. I want to like Frank Springer's artwork. It has a looseness to it, it is a casual style, and in some parts it does have a lot of energy, but mostly it just feels sloppy and unfinished. Can I recommend this issue? Well, sort of. I mean, it's sort of an important issue. It has early appearances of a few major characters, a first appearance of the shark, 
Uh, it reestablishes the link between Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes. It adds to the lore of Zartan, and it shows us his ability to instantly change his appearance. The artwork just isn't doing it for me, and the rapid transition from one scene to another and then back again, it is confusing and it breaks up the action, and it's not necessary for the story. Those random panels where we switch back to the Alcatraz scene, I didn't describe to you what happened in those panels, because because I didn't need to. They're unnecessary. You could have cut from the phone call from Hawk directly to the team opening the empty cell and you would have missed nothing. That real estate on those pages could have been dedicated to the swamp battle that was raging at the time and maybe used to give us better views of the vehicles and characters. That was issue number 25, a sort of important issue, but the next two issues are some of the most important issues in the entire series. I can't wait to move on and show you what's next, but that's all for this review. I hope you liked it and found it informative. I've been trying to do these comic book reviews once a month. I haven't always been able to keep up with them, but I do weekly G.I. Joe toy reviews, and I've got another one coming up next week. Next week's G.I. Joe toy review will be the final review of 2019. The week after that, we will have the answers video for the annual Q&A. Thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel, and thank you for watching. 2019 has been an amazing year, and 2020 is shaping up to be even better. I'll see you next week with a vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.